welcome everyone this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are in this great world. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about justice and technology. We've got a really good show for you and a program that's just going to, I think, really kind of change some of the way that um, people are are looking at technology and what we can do to make things more equitable. I am known to talk quite a bit, but I will try to keep it a little short today because we have so many great guests who have a lot of really important things to say, and that would not be me. With that said, I also just wanna make sure that everybody understands that we sometimes have technology problems with different platforms, as we all have learned over the last what is now 16 months or so things are not necessarily perfect but we try to be able enough to understand that and get through it and find some patience so with that said i have a couple of introductions to do i'm going to start with our guest list at first we have barry reeves who was appointed as the boston planning and development agency's first ever director of diversity equity and inclusion in 2020. Barry is a seasoned diversity practitioner with more than 15 years of experience. He has held positions of increasing responsibility in the diversity management staffing functions within the federal government and while serving on active duty for 18 years. Thank you so much for your service. We also have Daniela Corey, and uh, she is an alumni. She is from the Masters Landscaping Architecture 2018. She is a coordinator of course instruction and an assistant faculty in the School of Landscape Architecture at the BAC. Daniela is also co-chair of the committee K through 12 outreach for the Boston Society of Landscape Architecture, where she leads Youth Landscape Architect Studio in partnership with the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. Uh, she serves on the BAC's Pre-K through 12 Committee, working towards greater accessibility, inclusion, and awareness for youth in the design fields, which is fabulous. Daniela is an associate member of the American Society of Landscape Architects, as well as a member of the Environmental Education Society and the Ecological Landscape Alliance. Whew. Um, that's a lot. And we also have Calvin Connors. Um, I don't have a full bio for you. My apologies, Calvin, but we know he's the Associate Dean of Admissions and Recruitment for the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology. We also have Dave Snell, Senior Associate uh, PCA um, Incorporated. Dave has a keen understanding of market conditions and the drivers for successful development. He excels at planning and design of mixed use urban projects and public spaces that bring people together from all walks of life. Merging his project work and civil life together, uh, Dave is a leader in PCA's commitment to providing design education to minority students and help foster and support future design leaders in communities where underrepresentation of design professional is persistent. Also, we have Dr. Nikhil Satya. He's the chair and associate professor of engineering technology at Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology. We're very excited to have him this morning. He is an experienced technology educator with 10 plus years of experience in teaching, research, curriculum, program development, advising, and mentoring. His mission is to create student-focused classroom environments and sustainable pathways to a higher education in science and technology. And last but definitely not least, we have Colin Riley, who is our Director of Real Estate Development at the, the BAC. His focus is real estate finance, and he uses his role at the BAC to promote the development of commercial real estate property assets as college endowment. His research interests focus on capital markets and currently focus on the emerging trends in capital formation of wealth creation for developers of color. So fabulous. That is our lineup. And I also now have my co-host, well, actually, technically, he's the host. I'm just the moderator. So I'm going to introduce your host, it's Luis Perez de Marizzi. And he is an alumni as well. He's from the Bachelors of Landscape Architect 2016, class of 2016. The BAC, he's also part of the BAC Alumni Advisor Council 
Coupled with his personal and academic professional background in landscape architecture at the BAC has made Lewis a strong advocate for public land and their benefits to people and wildlife. After holding a few design positions in reputable firms, Lewis is currently working for the city of Newton Parks, recreation and cultural development to protect and enhance public open spaces so they may continue to forge memories and renewed experience to coming generations. So welcome, Luis. Hi, everyone. Um, so glad to be here. Uh, thank you, Janet, for the uh, thorough um, introductions. Um, it's really great to, to be here and, and sort of kick this uh, very important BAC talk series that, that is focused on technology. Uh, we do feel that while this topic is very important and that lots of innovation is occurring and has occurred, uh, regularly uh, with tech advances, um, it is critical to address issues with access to technology and professional development in underserved communities. Uh, this means, you know, uh, inner cities, women and girls, LGBTQ, rural regions, as well as persons with disabilities and other marginalized groups. Yeah, that's right. We we cannot talk about advancing the design profession without ensuring the next generation of designers reflect the populations um, that they are serving and we're designing for. I'm, I'm actually really excited to hear that a lot of students are joining us today. So that's fabulous. Indeed. And, and you know, we can safely say that diverse backgrounds often bring uh, more sensitivity into how designers respond to community needs as well as their client needs and, and just end up with a with a more enriching design at the end. Yeah, that's 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 absolutely true. So let's let's get into it. Um, Eliza, if you can go and show the, the five quick facts and if we've got or let me ask if we've got Barry. Um, we, I know that we were having some problems getting Barry um into onto the stage we we have barry barry i'm just going to ask that you raise your hand please and now i'm going to hide from the stage and i'm going to throw up the those facts okay louis you want to then ask barry the questions thank you sure um so as everyone can see in the screen uh there are some uh quick facts about um bipoc communities lgbtq communities um uh, persons with disabilities, um, as well as women. Uh, so as we're discussing, you'll see these facts uh, sort of come up. And, and we thought it was very impactful and important to share these. Um, so Barry, while we have you on the line, um, based on your work, what are two of the greatest barriers for vulnerable populations reaching the executive level in the workforce, uh, particularly in the design field. And it looks like Barry's not on, so let's... Uh, Is Barry muted or he's just not on? But we're working on Barry, so if you want to go to okay. the next question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Daniela, um, based on your work, um, what is one challenge and one opportunity of building ecosystems for designers at an early age? Uh, thank you, Luis, for that question. So I um, took some time thinking about this, and I'd say to answer in order, if I think about a challenge, it's actually really hard to think of just one. Um, so I'm going to quickly name three, as I see as sort of a spectrum of challenges, um, if we're trying to think about an ecosystem uh, of designers at an early age. So uh, for me, the, the main issues are awareness, awareness of the design fields, awareness of the design professions, awareness of design thinking, uh, reach and accessibility. So as we talk about equity as an issue, we also need to discuss how we actually reach uh, marginalized populations, how we reach students who don't typically have access to design education. And then uh, equity of opportunity. So if we're bringing, for example, youth programs um, across the design fields, then we need to make sure that those youth programs reach uh, a wide range of students um, from all different backgrounds and, uh, and extend opportunity. Um, and so a, a brief, you know, anecdote to that is that I 
am a land, I, I'm in landscape architecture. I, I teach landscape architecture. I didn't know the field existed until I was in my mid twenties. Uh, so I didn't enter the profession until much later. And we're finding that that age is going younger and younger every year, but it takes a lot of effort on our part to introduce the, the design fields and the design professions. And, and from my perspective, particularly landscape architecture to younger and younger people to allow them to be aware of the profession, even being a, a, an option for them. And then uh, opportunity is a, is a whole other conversation. And I think we could definitely speak of many, many more than just uh, one at this point. But I think if we're, again, looking at this word, of, this word ecosystem, uh, for me, it's about sustainability creating a support system um, so that there's a scaffold uh, underneath these youth who are getting involved in the design fields um, that takes them from you know a, a very young age all the way through to their to their professional careers um, so that may mean for example that students could get involved in design summer camps at a young age and then progress to uh, a project I'll talk about later which is our, our youth landscape architecture studio which is um, for high school students. And then from there, you are being given an opportunity to become an intern at a firm. And all of this creates continuation. Um, so you're not having a one-off moment of engaging with students. Um, you're allowing them to really understand design thinking and learn about design process at many ages and sustain that through their young uh, education until they enter college if they choose to. Um, and if they want to become designers, fantastic. If they don't, you've given them an opportunity to understand what design thinking can offer them as they enter professions. So, you know, imagining us as designers and, and design thinkers being able to populate future uh, professionals at any level, whether they're, you know, doctors or lawyers or designers, um, the president of the United States, you know, how amazing would it be to think that all of them had a foundation in design thinking and how that might change the way that they approach the work that they do, how they problem solve. And um, so to me, the opportunity really comes from understanding that it can't be just this small moment. It has to be uh, a foundation that really sustains them over time. Thank you, Daniela. And as a follow up um, on the on the effort, um, Calvin and or Dave, um, based on your experience, what, what level of effort is needed to continue to keep growing these these ecosystems of, of young designers and young professionals? I think um, I think educating um, we look at like the uh, tech industry, for instance, um, women make up about 16% of the leadership um, in the tech field. So, you know, I think educating because these aren't fields that, you know, people really grow up analyzing and wanting to go into, but, you know, as they get introduced to these um, programs, they can become um, interested and it could be a few, uh, potential future um, career for these uh, students. So I think a lot of educating, especially in these fields that just aren't common to our students. If I could add a little bit to that, you know, and picking up on what Daniela said on the professional side. So as a firm, um, taking it from uh, as these kids come through college or high school and, and get to that professional setting, we need to continue that scaffolding and the infrastructure that Daniela was talking about um, and recognize that this is a marathon, not a sprint. We need to do things that are changing cultures of firms and we are uh really considering how to just bake this in to make sure that it lives on uh throughout time as just the way that um we all do business and just the um what the profession looks like so for us uh at pca uh that is our jedi group we have um uh, a whole infrastructure based around this that tackles a lot of different um, arenas uh, that we're constantly working on and evolving. And, and that's between education and growing the next generation and our expanding networks and uh, you know changing some of the work that we do, quite frankly, to more socially responsible work. Um, but the growing of the next generation is really one of the things that we've all gleaned as the is what strikes us as one of the most important things. Because as um, as people have been saying, uh, our profession, I wouldn't say has the, the 
greatest welcome mat uh, to the BIPOC community. Uh, it's some out there, it's really difficult to know how to become an architect or a designer or uh, what the path looks like. And however we can create relationships at young ages with uh, students to uh, either provide mentorship or guidance or opportunities uh, for them to uh, see the see the path, see see how they could imagine themselves becoming an architect or a designer or getting into the technology fields. Uh, we th we think that that's a that's a critical piece. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Janet, are you? I believe you're muted. Oh, poo. Um, yeah, <laughs> it never fails, right? You, but we're just not just talking about um, BIPOC individuals. We're also talking about um, women, talking about um, the LGBTQ community. We're also talking about people with disabilities. So, oh, Eliza, brilliant. Um, so here we go. Children with disabilities are more, almost four times more likely to experience violence than children without disabilities. So you've, you've got a disadvantage right there. Maybe um, what we can do is bring in um, Nikhil and Calvin while we're still waiting a little bit for Barry. Um, Nikhil, what are some of the solutions that you have found to be beneficial? So going back to uh, what Daniela mentioned earlier, uh, providing the foundation uh, seems to be the key at an early age as, as part of uh, uh, technology education and innovation, uh, we have been uh, providing such a solution uh, for the past few years. And uh, there are uh, plenty of uh, opportunities for uh, students to get involved at an early age in college through early access programs or uh, through programs uh, that can provide them uh, experience through summer uh, camps or summer programs at colleges. Now, these uh, programs are intended uh, to provide the students awareness and uh, uh, the information about accessibility to uh, courses and programs in technology at various levels. The early access to college programs uh, get these students involved in college courses for credit they can take those credits and move on to a field that they're interested in or uh, they can uh, become aware of what's available in the near future and they can uh, make decisions about uh, what suits uh, their profile best or their interests best now these uh, uh, type of uh, programs where the students get exposed to the opportunities that are, that are available in the field of education, especially in the technological field of education, uh, make it uh, more convenient for students who are uh, in, in, a, in a students who come from a diverse uh, group of uh, uh, communities, uh, where some of them are first-generation college-going students who do not have any information about what college looks like and, and, and uh, what the technological field looks like and what additional opportunities that they may have in order to go from high school all the way to the industry. So creating that pathway and providing the foundation early in their age is what we found as a successful uh, moment in, in, uh, uh, in creating that interest as well as uh, making sure that there is increased awareness in the community for these type of programs. And I think also um, getting involved in the community. So going to places that these um, that these young people are. So um, community-based organizations like the YMCA, um, Boys and Girls Club, um, places that we know that our students in the community are, and um, making these making these options available and visible to them. Right. I just want to just want to say we have Barry with us by phone. Barry. You, oh. you don't see him on the chat, but he is with us by phone. So um, I'm going to uh, turn my camera off, but have my mic on and you will hear Barry. So I just wanted you to know, um, carry on with the conversation. But Barry is here when uh, when it's he's up. So. All right, well, Calvin, maybe we could put a pin in it and we'll go and we'll hear a little bit from, um, we'll hear a little bit from Barry first. 
I, I love the uh, the loophole in technology here, you know. <laughs> um, Barry, so uh, welcome uh, and thanks for joining us. So one one quick question for you: um, What in, in with your work? What are the two or maybe three uh, greatest barriers for vulnerable populations reaching the executive level? executive level in the workforce and and by executive level meaning either owning their own businesses or just being or just you know like, okay. running one um well that's a great question i would say to you that probably the, the number one barrier is mentorship um and getting that key mentorship at the at their appropriate places and times for um, professional development and growth allowing that person to be at the same level of speed with their with their peers so that way they can do that. So that's a huge hinder. If you look at any of the surveys, you will find that 70, you know, a good percentage of those populations don't get their appropriate mentorship and development at the key level, key, key jobs to actually allow them to grow. I think the second challenge is, is that it's um, the development when it comes to correct positions and identification of their career paths and what they want to do. Those things don't generally happen early enough in a lot of minorities and by you know, by individuals. And so that lack of ability to develop and kind of understand the, the prerequisite schools that will help support their growth up to the sea level doesn't happen in a, in a timely manner. And so they're not able to uh, progress. I think other institutionally and stuff like that, just from a barrier standpoint, there's also just from a food standpoint, there's just a lack of mentors that are the same color, same culture, same things so that have just kind of intimidated or created a, a space where a lot of minorities don't feel like they can actually perceive it because they don't feel like the person understands that, that background. Thank you, Barry. And um, Calvin, you were um, sort of uh, discussing a, a little bit about um, what the Ben Franklin Institute is doing currently. Um, could you speak a little bit about uh, your mentorship program and how, uh, you know, your 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 program is perhaps uh, tackling some of the issues that Barry just mentioned in regard of lack of mentorship for youth. Yeah, in the admissions office, what we do is we have a lot of our um, a lot of our graduates um, go back to their high schools and go to their favorite their favorite class and really just talk about their experience on where they are and um, how they got introduced to the field and you know some of the fun aspects to. Um, introduce their, you know, friends to programs that they're probably not even um, considering. And we found that to be very successful because um, it's easier for students to picture themselves somewhere after somebody that they already know is actually going through it. Um, so, you know, that reality really kicks in. And that's something that we've, we've seen, you know, just be, um, you know, really beneficial to the students because they actually could see themselves doing it and they actually persist through. Um, so that's one of the things that we're doing. We also have, we have scholarships for women. Uh, we have a women in tech scholarship, which is something that we're trying to do to increase the uh, women in the tech field. Um, like I said earlier, 16% um, of the leadership in the tech field are women. So we're, you know, we're trying to change that, change that number, increase that number. Um, so all the opportunities that we offer here at Benjamin Franklin, we're trying to, you know, just bring the diversity, bring women, bring people that aren't typically thinking about these programs into the, into the, um, you know, into our space so we can show them the outcomes that we're offering. And we've seen that to be very beneficial. That's fabulous, Calvin. I love the fact that um, uh, BFIT is so progressive in this area. And I like the fact that the BACA and, and you guys are, are trying to work together to really try to make some positive changes, which is, it only benefits all of us at the end of the day, doesn't it? So um, with the interest of time and um, the interest of making sure that we get our last part of the segment out, I'm really sorry that Barry couldn't have been here because there would have been a, a great, I mean, I know he's on the phone, but a really great voice to have been here on the top of the program. But we're going to start talking a little bit more about call to action. And so I don't know, Luis, if you want to kick that off. 
Sure. Uh, you know, as, as we all mentioned earlier today, um, you know, it's, it's, the buck doesn't stop here. Um, you know, it, it, as Daniela mentioned, there, there has to be this continuation and we're all seeing that the continuation is, is effective. Um, so at this point, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for, um, for folks out there who are, you know, networking in the tables or just w watching this now or on the chat to just get involved. Um, at this point, there is a, a number of youth um, who are at a disadvantage and we really here at the BAC, we want to start moving toward providing more opportunities for those folks. And, and we are really looking for those uh, partnerships. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's all I have to say in that regard. Janet, if you have anything else to, to add to that as well. And you are muted. Apologies, try to be good. I think what we should do is go through our panelists and why don't we start with Colin from the BAC. Colin, you wanna take it away? What is, what is the BAC up to? Good morning, everyone. My project is focused on real estate as endowment. And I see there's a meeting place between the college and its technology focus and community. So in a sense, what I'm trying to do is to understand how a typical college endowment operates. At the moment, I'm looking at an asset allocation process, which works on about 55% fixed income securities which involves a lot of real estate, including real estate securities and other types of assets, 35% allocated to equity and 10% to cash and other cash equivalents. Now, the BAC is going through a, a sort of a, a strategic repositioning and the goal is to increase the student enrollment from an average of about 700 up to 2000 but I have a sort of a, a, a slightly different goal, supportive of the, the, the initiative, but also creating a de-risk portfolio of properties that will serve a, maybe two or three functions. One, to build relationships and to create opportunities for our students to do professional practice, both in the development planning work and the actual building construction and the operations of the properties. The second one is to create a, an interface between the BAC and community, because my expectation is that as we roll out this property, port for, this property portfolio over the next 10 years, our target should be about 1,000 units spread across strategic locations, mostly in New England. And the goal would be to have the young people who grow up in these buildings to be connected technologically to the BAC, to be offered scholarships of some kind, and to be provided with the option for a technology-based design education. So it's, it's using the bricks and mortar approach to developing property and layering on top of that a platform for lots of partnerships, lots of opportunities to, to engage with community, to build smart technology into the buildings, to think about the issues surrounding what buildings of the future are going to look like, and, and how they function in terms of energy and in terms of their wired and connectedness to the internet, other types of issues. So those are my initial thoughts. My action plan is to seek uh, BAC leadership approval for this pr project <laughs> and to have it be a funded research, which is multidisciplinary. And my target is the National Science Foundation the NSF does not fund architecture projects. So my strategy is to go in as an economic idea. So BAC uh, and property as endowment, that's my focus. <laughs> that's great. We have, um, we have Barry on the phone. Again, Barry from uh, Boston Planning and Development Agency uh, with a response to Colin's point about real estate. Terrific. Barry? I will say that he's got some great initiatives. Real estate can be uh, actually. Eliza, can you get Eliza? Can you get the phone closer to the microphone, please? 
Um, okay. Sorry, Barry, can you speak up again? Yeah, Thank you. To his point, you know, he has some valid, valid um, points that real estate can be a definite equity driver. I believe the thing that we're going to have to work through in all those initiatives is making sure that the ability for people to get financing, binding, and all the other resources necessary. And so what we, the, I think the bigger challenge is making sure that as we recruit people to go and use real estate as an equity driver, and wealth builder, how do we ensure that they're able to get access to the capital that they need to actually invest in these properties? And not just the small lots, you know, where they're you know, doing maybe residential homes. We're talking about big, larger commercial developments that allow them to build generational wealth. And so I'm hoping that along with those initiatives that he's pushing, we're also having a conversation around how do we ensure that they access the capital and resources and support to actually go do these larger real estate developments that will empower the communities and the, the large minority communities as well. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to give a very specific response to Barry's uh, comments. One of the things I'm working on at the moment is a profiling of some emerging programs being rolled out by Citibank and Freddie Mac. And their target is wealth building for emerging borrowers of color and other minority groups. So I am going to be leading that initiative for students of color who uh, sign up and enroll in either our Masters of Design Studies in Real Estate Development, continue ed continuing education classes, or the Certificate in Real Estate Development. So all of those initiatives, if you come to the BAC, you're coming to a <laughs> college that is emphasizing uh, wealth building for people of color. And, and that's great. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, ex I'm stoked and excited about seeing how the outcomes. I will just once again reiterate the challenge that I see, at least in my work with the agency and what we see out in the in the current domain right now, is always around access to capital and abilities. Um, there's the issue of capacity when it comes to a lot of real estate development or just a purchase of real estate, being able to get access. And um, I think there was a fast fact we talked about where. Um, a lot of uh, minority owners or opportunities don't are, aren't able to secure the type of funding um, at the same levels that their maybe their white counterparts could secure um, without that help. And so we want to really see an equity move in the real estate area. We have to ensure that we're not just addressing the surface level, which is education, but also addressing the, the, the systematic issues within the system and the process itself. We have to ensure that banks are not just lending, um, you know, their lending practices are straight and forward and that they're not creating more barriers by inhibiting or not allowing those those minority um, commercial real estate people to actually get the type of capital and access to capital to allow them to do developments and pursue their opportunities as such. One of the features of the BAC's real estate master's degree program is what we are calling a comprehensive real estate development portfolio or proposal where a student can work over 12 months to create a proposal that is actionable and buildable. And we're gonna teach them along the way, all of the strategies, all of the sources of information surrounding equity and debt financing with an emphasis on equity. Because debt is easy once equity is in place. So people of color and equity will be a sub-research theme for this financial feasibility analysis work and this financial engineering work. Because we have to build the securities of the future to give people of color a real opportunity in these markets. Agreed. You know, and I mean, I, I love the fact that everybody, we're, we're trying to work towards the same goal, both the BAC and, and then BFIT and the city of Boston are, are really trying to work collaboratively. I think that that's fabulous. I'm, I'm a little concerned with time. That's part of my job is to make sure that we um, are, are kind of cohesive. I want to give everybody else a, a chance to kind of wrap up a little bit. Maybe there's something that you would like for the listeners to know before we go. I don't know. Maybe we can, um, why don't we start with, um, uh, why don't we start with Daniela? Thanks, Janet. Um, so just a couple of quick things to share with everyone. If we're talking about calls to action and thinking about um, creating infrastructure for, for you and, you know, from my perspective, it's, it's for youth. Um, so as, as co-chair of the, this committee, K through 12 committee at the Boston Society of Landscape Architects, we, we just started last July and we've 
been pushing forward a lot of initiatives. Um, one of them is the Youth Landscape Architecture Studio in partnership with the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. And it's still happening now. It, it, students meet three times a week. Uh, and what's been really fantastic about this program is that we've been able to partner with the ENC to, um, to develop a program that pays the students. So we have 10 students from the city of Boston um, working on a live project, which is the Franklin Park development. They're mentored by the firm that's running that project and they're taught by three teaching assistants from the BAC um, who are grad students in landscape architecture. So we have this intergenerational program happening that really builds a, a really strong foundation. Um, but the students are paid, the TAs are paid, um, the firms are, are volunteering their time. And, um, and because it's a live project, students have been exposed to all facets of the project. They've spoken to uh, policy advisors. They've spoken to people who work in public health. Um, people who have run the, the community engagement aspect of the Franklin Park development. Um, so they've had a lot of exposure to all, um, all different facets of how we design public space. And so that's one program and it's gonna happen again next year. We're looking at it becoming an annual, annual project um, with the ENC. Um, and then the committee is also um, looking at how we could build uh, opportunities for high school internships um, in firms, which is an unusual unusual project you know most firms are bringing in um, university level students who have a particular level of knowledge that they can offer a firm it's different obviously with high school students who are being completely introduced to a new a new subject area they don't come in with very um, the skills that you would expect from an intern yet we can build a really fantastic program of high school interns um, in in area firms in Boston and then the final project which I think is really exciting and something that is my major call to action because it involves all of us. Um, we're looking at building, and it's gonna take time, um, a field guide to youth engagement, which would be a, a resource for firms um, of, you know, and right now it's looking at landscape architecture, but I imagine it could be something much broader. And the point is that it, it, it becomes a sort of manual for how firms doing, especially public projects, but really any projects that have an opportunity to engage youth are expected to engage youth. It almost becomes a standard practice. Um, and, and we would be able to provide a guide for how to do that um, because of our experience and, and bringing in partners. That's the other part of this is that, you know, we can't do it alone as a, as a society of landscape architects. We need to partner with people who are already doing youth programs, with schools in the area, uh, with teachers, with parents, you know, everyone who has a, a say in the future of, of youth um, to play a role in this so that we have a really sort of profound understanding of what it means to really engage youth in design processes and, and design thinking um, programs. So that's kind of my call to action is we need to, um, we need to all get involved in this from many different angles. Great. I saw a lot of thumbs up and a lot of um, little icons of, of uh, like bulbs and stuff like that. I think that's wonderful. Calvin, do you want to go next? Sure, I, I'll keep it brief. I think um, the biggest call to action for us is really just to, to continue to educate. Um, tell a friend, tell a family member, um, you know, the more information that you receive, just spread the word. Because I think the more people that begin to talk about some of these, um, these industries, the more it becomes a norm, wherein it becomes comfortable for people to actually start to um, visualize and see themselves in these, um, in these industries. So I think just continue to tell tell more people and just educate people and um, tell them not to be afraid to go out on a limb. I love that. Thank you. Another another one with a whole bunch of thumbs up and oh, and a couple of applauses too. Nikhil, do you want to do you want to piggyback on that? Uh, sure. Uh, just to add uh, something to what Calvin said, uh, I would say networking uh, uh, among organizations and community organizations is uh, the most important here. Uh, because it's critical for us to get connected to various uh, community organizations in order to reach out to people. So we have been doing our part uh, on site and uh, it, we've been taking opportunity to reach out to students through schools, especially uh, in and around Boston. But uh, getting more involved with the community organizations would give us more avenues to provide information to a large group of people. And, and I believe that will increase awareness as well as the uh, opportunities that are available uh, to students at an early age. Terrific. That was lovely. Dave, do you want to 
jump through and, and give us your last thoughts here that you want people to know? Absolutely. So we've been talking a lot about how to uh, access that younger generation and um, bring you know, open their eyes to design thinking. And we are huge fans of the BAC Summer Academy. And one of the things that we, uh, we partnered with the BAC on is creating an opportunity fund. Uh, so this uh, stemming from our Jedi group uh, in keeping with the uh, acronyms uh, coming from Star Wars, we uh, coined it as the Yoda Fund, which is Youth Opportunities for Diversity in Architecture. It's actually coined by uh, William Watkins from the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts, who is a partner of ours in this effort where we are sending uh, five students a year to the Summer Academy in partnership with the Urban League. And, uh, you know, it's just a wonderful program that we believe full heartedly in. And uh, we had the opportunity uh, after last year's um, Summer Academy to meet one of the students, uh, Kylie, who, who went. And, you know, she never saw a path for herself into architecture or design. She just really liked to draw. And uh, just speaking with her and hearing about her experience and how it opened her eyes, it was really wonderful. And you know, just, uh, at least for me personally, really uh, spoke to how important uh, this access is and, and really making these connections and providing these opportunities. So she's coming back again this year, it sounds like, which we're very excited about. And uh, we hope uh, to help support uh, a lot of students over the coming years uh, to participate in this great program. And and then hopefully uh, someday they'll, they'll come and work for us. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dave. Colin, do you want to Actually, let me go to Barry first, and and, and before I, we jump off from Barry, um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, anytime Barry talks about all the, the the problems that we see within these underserved communities, um, I get very inspired. So, take it away, Barry. Leave us with something, something pointed and and good. Okay, so here, so I get a chance to make a call to action. So here's my call. In whatever space that you inhabit, in whatever tech, whatever domain that you have, think sustainability. Think about how we can make sure that all of our initiatives can go beyond just the one opportunity or the one-off. We need to think about DEI holistically, not just as a people of color issue, but veterans, single people, married, all the different groups that, that are impacted and infected because diversity and equity and inclusion is about creating the platform and a table that allows everyone to have full and equal access to the opportunities that allow them to be successful. And so a lot of times our programs are creating barriers and limitations within the same population we hope to serve. So when we think about our solutions, let's think holistically and let's think about how do we create a sustainable program that builds legacy, that builds wealth, that builds opportunity, and that builds a lasting connection for in the entire uh, people that we hope to serve and, and promote. And I think that if we all take a holistic approach to it and partner together because we're all trying to choose, we're all trying to move in the same direction. So let's get out of our silos and work together. Let's talk across the aisles and see what you're doing and what that other individual that group is doing and, co and, co and pull our collective resources to actually make things happen um, for, the, for the people um, that we serve. And so my call to action is to come out of your silos, work collaboratively, work holistically, and create sustainable opportunities for DEI. Well, okay. Thanks so much. Colin, you're up next. Yeah, just call to action, the understanding the presence of real estate ownership and the opportunity it provides us to be creating even more lasting relationships with community and the opportunities for doing all of the positive things that spatial designers talk about and community activists are interested in seeing play out itself in real wealth and real value creation. We're not just thinking of wealth in terms of money, but accessing the technologies of the future at the interface that provides the young people we are influencing with the platforms to go forward confidently, knowing that they are within a system that is well-designed and which accounts for many of the things that they struggle with, which is access to all of the, the high value and other types of assets that create the opportunities for them to live much better lives and for them to break the generational gap about poverty and lack of education in 
something, things that we can control and do a much better job of delivering. All right. Terrific. Thank you so much. Luis, why don't you wrap it up for everybody? Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so just to wrap it up, um, it looks like there's uh, quite a bit of uh, great stuff going on. We have uh, the BSLA, uh, Daniela's um, um, field guide initiative. Um, the network networking is important to do, um, you know, uh, the Yoda fund. Um, and sustainable collaboration. So we're we're really looking at you know touching all on all the points that all the speakers brought up, which is you know mentor uh, youth, um, provide economic um, uh, vitality by perhaps even co-signing for a BIPOC uh, person who's trying to get their foot through the door, um, and just um, again uh, just getting more opportunities to these youth so um with that i i again i'm reaching out to the folks out in the in the um listening in in the chats in the waiting rooms and the tables just let's collaborate let's start something um let's continue uh to to get going on this work um because it is important and and, and if not now when Okay, terrific. We're running out of time. I don't even think we have time for Q&A. My apologies. Again, it's technology. We're, we're, we're doing the best we can. This was really fantastic. Um, please, everybody, please stay in touch. Please, please, please start thinking about what you can do in your community or within Boston to try to do some of these call to actions from all these very smart and very talented individuals. So have a good day, everybody.